that the bathrooms are over there by the water fountain. And I don't know if anyone has any announcements that they need to share. I guess not. So I think you're... Oh, Carol does? Yeah. Um, there's no ladies' Bible study next week. Why? They will study this week and next week. Because <laughs> Carol's on vacation. So if there aren't any other announcements, if we could just kind of smile and wave to our neighbors. <laughs> See you. What? <laughs> <laughs> He was all panicking. <laughs> <laughs> Not as much enthusiasm as last week. <laughs> I mean, at least they talked about kind of parameters, like she'll stay in the classroom and have like the person to come in and work Let's take a moment to prepare our hearts for worship. Please stand for the call to worship. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving, and let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountains, and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Let's pray. Father, whenever we think about the world in which we live and recognize that you made it with speech, uh, it came into being at a, at a moment of time, and you designed it so that it came out the way it did, and that we are able to perceive that, and we, the more we learn about it, the more in awe we are of your majesty and greatness and power. And then when we think that this God who made all these things and who rules the universe and rules history, has condescended to make himself our God and enable us to be his people. And then that phrase, that we are the sheep of his hand, that is to say you have an intimate relationship with each one of us, you're involved in our lives personally. That's our experience, our Father. And we're here to give great gratitude to you, to celebrate your greatness, to celebrate your power, to celebrate your salvation and to renew our relationship with you and celebrate all that you do for us. Help us to do that, Father. Help us, as the, the psalm says, to meet with you, to speak to you, to address you, and to celebrate you, and to bow down before you. I pray that we would hear your voice as well. And we pray that everything that is done here would resound to the glory of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our opening worship song is in Christ alone. I think you all know this one pretty well. Mm -hmm.
so many needs, so much pain in our lives and in this world we live in. Our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. Help us to empty ourselves of worry and anxiety and place our lives more fully in your hands. As we seek to further your kingdom on this earth, we ask for your blessed guidance and wisdom as we at First Baptist rebuild our wonderful house of worship. As Paul writes, suffering brings patience, and patience brings perseverance, and perseverance brings hope. Pain and struggle become our pathway to hope. Our God is sovereign, and he loves us no matter what we face. We know he wants what is best for us. His plans are still to prosper. He has not forgotten us. He is with us in the fire and the flood. He is faithful forever, perfect in love. He is sovereign over us. Amen. It's a new song to you. Some of you may know it, but it is called Sovereign. There 
Praise the congregation. Um, I want to remind you of a verse I referred to a few weeks ago. When I said, if you look at the image of the throne in the book of Revelation, the only thing human that affects the throne and the course of history that flows out of the throne is the prayers of the saints. That's a remarkable, remarkable statement. Here we have the sovereignty of God displayed, the Holy One praised, the Lamb who was slain praised, everything in creation praising Him, honoring Him, an indication that everything happens under His sovereignty. And there's one image of human interaction in that, and that is the prayers of the saints aided by heaven. There in the throne room of God. It's an immense privilege that we have here. We, we're told to do something. He said, the writer, of God said to Solomon after the temple was dedicated, he said, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. I, I think this call is something that we ought to heed especially now, and recognize that we've been appointed by God as his people. We're a church, a lampstand in this place, and that we've been appointed to be part of the solution, and that uh, the, our greatest need is to seek his face and to, to get our life right with him. When we do that, we can be sure that God will intervene for us. We pray as a congregation, and every other week we do what's called popcorn prayer, what I lead out at a time of... Uh, a praise, and I want you to join with me in there in your hearts, but then there's going to be a time of silence when you can bring your own petitions and praises to God, but we just use a word or two, and in that way we set this thing that's on our mind and our heart in the presence of God, knowing that he knows all about it anyway, and just entrust it to him, expecting him to intervene, and then after that's done, I'll close, so let's pray together. <coughs> 
Father, we thank you for the image of the throne in the Bible. It happens quite a few times, and I think particularly of the book of Isaiah, because he was a prophet representing you during a time when the people of God were going to begin to experience <coughs> incredible upheaval, difficulty that had never been, um, that they'd never experienced before. Uh, the beginning of the dismemberment of the nation, the beginning of the conquest and exile of the people, they were going to experience some very difficult things. They, uh, you had been warning them from years to years that you were going to, to bring that last and final curse upon them because of their disobedience, but there were people who were faithful to you who were caught up in it. And as that message was, as Paul, Isaiah was being commissioned to bring that message, you gave him a vision of your holiness and you were thrown. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Uh, the recognition that we do everything. We live all of our lives under the sovereign God who's bringing himself honor uh, in the world. That is to say, he is letting his greatness and goodness be known to the world so they can see him and worship him and receive his salvation. I thank you for that reality, Father, that we realize that's the truth. That's what we sang today. You are sovereign over us. Our lives are in your hands. We thank you that we can have that assurance and confidence that Jesus Christ is Lord, that all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. And I thank you, Father, also for the way that book, the book of Isaiah, ends. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me, or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things if they came into being, says the Lord? It's an amazing image, Father. You don't need our help. You are active in human history. You are the sovereign over all. You don't need our help. But you have given us the privilege of representing you in our world when we depend on you. And so we come here today, Father, in light of that, <coughs> recognizing that you are the king, <coughs> that you are the creator, that you're sovereign in history and in our own lives. We acknowledge that and bow before you now, and that you're accomplishing your purpose now. And so we pray, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We are here, our Father, to acknowledge that what you want is best. And we ask you to give us direction and to take and take note of the needs we bring to you um, and act in the way that you think best. Amy. Elsa. Father, you've instructed us to pray for our country, and we do that. We pray for the President and Congress, uh, that they would recognize that they stand under the throne of God Almighty, that you would awaken them to the reality of their uh, precarious position, having the authority and power that they do, uh, that you are their judge, and that what they do matters to you. I pray that you'd help them to embrace that. And I pray, Father, also for our nation. It, it, there are three, three things that come to mind. There are three sorts of people on the front lines right now. One is uh, hospital workers. Um, we ask, Father, that you protect them and in, the, in their fatigue and in the, uh, the work that they're doing, that you would teach them to reach out to you for protection and help and a sense of mission. And you'd help us to be appreciative of them. I also think of the police, Father, in our country. Uh, there are some bad apples, Father, and sometimes something has to be done. But they are now, more than ever, in a very, very dangerous position, called upon to protect and serve. And yet, uh, the respect is gone to, in a lot of places, and they become victory of ambush, victims of ambush and things like that. And we ask, Father, that you would protect them, and that something can be done in the next 
little while by the leadership of our country to make sure that this is done in a way that doesn't harm them, but the, the, the allows the people to be safe. The third people I, I want to pray for, Father, that are on the front lines are people in difficult neighborhoods across the country where the violence seems to be more rife than it's been in years and years and years and years. Innocent people are being shot and killed and wounded, and people are afraid to go out of their doors. It is a disgraceful thing that in a country with this much um, that this should happen. And Father, we ask you that you would be merciful to us and that somehow that would Our scripture reading today is from Jeremiah, chapter 17, verses 5 through 8. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man, and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water, that sends out its roots by the stream, and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. May you be blessed as you hear and obey God's word. This is usually the time when we do our offering, but um, since we're not doing that, there is the basket there for our offering. Do you want to do it outside? Yes, oh, we should. <laughs> Thank God Karen's here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys can sing this one. Okay. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Lord. Testament. It's after Romans and 1 Corinthians and before Galatians and Ephesians. Chapter 2 and verse 12. <coughs> Second Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12. Paul says, And when I came into Troas for the gospel of Christ, and a door was opened for me in the Lord, I did not have rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus my brother there. But I said goodbye to them, and I went away into Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in his triumphal procession in Christ, and spreads through, manifests to us the fragrance of the knowledge of him in every place. Because we are the aroma of Christ to God, among those who are being saved, and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like the many who peddle the word of God, but as from purity, but as from God, in the presence of God, in Christ we speak. I pray, our Father, that you would enable us to understand what Paul is getting at here and see the revolutionary nature of our calling and his calling. And because of that, we might be like he says. Uh, instruments, channels of your surpass, the surpassing greatness of your power. 
and that we would, uh, as Jeremiah has said, not trust in the arm of flesh, but trust in the Lord, so that we might live under your blessing as we do your work in the world. I pray that we hear the voice of Jesus Christ, and because we've heard it, we be enabled by your Holy Spirit to put it into practice. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now, two of my favorite Christian authors, it's uh, Os Guinness, who's uh, my trade, a sociologist, and uh, David Wells, who is a theologian. He's actually from South Africa. Um, uh, they both agree that the evangelical church, and by that I mean the Bible-believing church, is deeply compromised by its uncritical acceptance of the assumptions and methods of the modern world. And by the way, I agree with them. Um, I was there in seminary when it happened. Uh, before I was a student, when, you were taught, when they taught young men and women to be pastors, they taught them ecclesiology. That is the doctrine of the church. What the Bible says about the church, how it's run, and so on. So they, they know what to aim for when they are leaders of the church. And they were taught pastoral theology, that what the Bible teaches about Christian leadership, specifically what it says about pastors. In order that, they would know how to accomplish this purpose of leading the church in their own lives. And they also learned missiology. That's what the Bible teaches about uh, the mission of outreach and evangelism and discipleship. So you know how to, uh, the proper direction for reaching people and growing as a church. That's what happened before I got there. Um, that was replaced, and while I was there, we were beginning the, the re-implementation of that, first of all, by a course called Pastoral Leadership. Um, and basically what it was, was insights from the studies in business leadership from the major universities. That, you know, they have the, what are they, have the, um, you get an MBA, Master's of Business Administration. A lot of those insights, and psychology, and amateur, and I say amateur advisedly, uh, amateur sociological analysis of the church and its mission. That's what replaced it. Lots of surveys, lots of studies like this. What works, what doesn't work. And the fellow who taught it was very interesting. He had a PhD in theology with an emphasis on pastoral theology. So he had never studied, he'd never gotten an MBA, didn't study those things, and he'd never been a pastor. And so as he was teaching this course, he seemed lost. And we thought he was lost. And, <laughs> sorry. And ecclesiology and missiology was replaced by something called church growth. And it was the insights from the science of marketing and amateur sociology applied to the church mission in life. And when I was there, there was a lively debate about it uh, from some of us. We debated as to whether or not all this stuff was, biblical, was biblically faithful. Uh, but the focus, that focus on those disciplines, as they're called, has won the day in most seminaries. And to see you, uh, you, could, you could have seen this in the 1980s. Now, I know that shows how old I am. There was the, the, the flagship magazine for Christian leadership among evangelicals was called Leadership Magazine. And there was an analysis done of Leadership Magazine by, uh, I can't remember who did it, but recited in David Wells' books, book. And I, I don't remember the exact numbers. I forgot to look at it this morning, just before. But I know it was less than 10% of the articles cited scripture. These were supposed to be articles telling men and women how to lead the church. Less than 10% of them cited a verse of scripture or mentioned the name of Jesus. Now, on the surface, this change in emphasis seemed to, to have worked. Uh, we have megachurches now. That happened from the 70s onward with this new analyzing and focusing on marketing and leadership dynamics and so on. And the church planting movements were started by most of the evangelical denominations. They began to plant more churches. But there are two ways you can see that, that, the, that, that it didn't work out as well as they thought it was going to. First of all, <coughs> the actual number of committed Bible-believing Christians in the United States since that time has declined. That's true. It's incontestable. Well, but what is more telling, no one can deny that our culture has been shifting over the last 40 years or so, 50 years, that it has been moving further and further away from its Christian assumptions and Christian behavior and Christian ideas, Christian thought, and Christian morality. Everybody knows that. 
nobody can miss that. But one of the remarkable things that's happened is that despite that fact, Christians themselves, Bible-believing Christians, these are confessing Christians who believe in Jesus, who believe the Bible is the Word of God, their behavior and their attitudes and their the, what they believe about the world and God is getting closer and closer to the world as the world gets further and further away from what the Bible teaches. Now you can see a lot of this analysis in some of these studies and so on uh, in a lot of David Wells' books, uh, but the one that probably is the most succinct and helpful is The Courage to be Protestant. It's a very good book. It's a bad title, but it's a good book. <laughs> now, this all came to a head for me when I went to a, a, an annual meeting. I hate annual meetings, but the annual meetings of this denomination are pretty good. Good cover. What? Good cover. Yeah. <laughs> they really are pretty good. Anyway, I went, and I got a chance to hear Dale Edwards. Um, <coughs> It's one of the best sermons. It is the best sermon I've ever heard from a denominational executive, without any question. And it started off with something about he was fixing, I think, a snowblower, and it was full of mice. And he talked about the process of having the mice run all over the place and fixing it and getting rid of the mice and so on. And it was a very funny story. And then when, after I was thinking about the sermon later, I couldn't see any relationship between the mice and the, and the, and the snowblower in the sermon. But it got my attention. But the sermon was amazing, and he said something that I've never forgotten. It hit me right here, and I never forget. He said, we have lost confidence in the victory of Jesus Christ as a church. We have lost confidence in the victory of Jesus Christ. Like I said, the whole sermon was great. When I heard it, I saw how insightful he was to see that as the precise issue, and it was both insightful and heartbreaking at the same, same time. Lost confidence in the victory of Jesus Christ. Now, judging from what Paul writes here, I think he would say the same thing. And what he tells us in this passage is that benefiting from God's victory demands a life, a God-centered life. Benefiting from God's victory demands a God-centered life. Now, what I want to do is I want to start with a review and some of the background that we went through last week, just briefly, so you can catch up to speed here and see where we are, so we can focus on that, that minor point about how to be God-centered. What does he mean by God-centered, okay? Now, remember that Paul had been in a long struggle with the church in Corinth that was deeply compromised in its behavior, uh, its, mor its moral behavior, and in its, the content of its faith, its beliefs, by compromise with contemporary Greek culture. And so Paul had been a long struggle with that with them, and at the same time, there were false teachers trying to drive a wedge be between Paul and the church. And they did this by criticizing Paul, by putting him down. And they were having some success, and so Paul was in an awkward position. He recognized that he was the leader of the church, and they needed to listen to him and put things right, but, they saw, but he saw that, if he lost his standing with those people and they would no longer listen to him because of this wedge that was being driven by the criticism of these false teachers, he was, he would, not only would he lose the church, but they would lose their grip of Christ. And so he had to do something that he didn't really want to do, that he really uh, hated doing. That was to defend himself and his ministry. Now, the false teachers had said he was unqualified to teach or to lead the church. Uh, they made they made fun of his stature and the way he looked, but that wasn't a major thing. They said, first of all, you're crazy. Paul is crazy. And you can see that by the fact that everywhere he goes, whenever he does ministry, he starts riots. He ends up getting thrown in jail. He's always doing all these crazy things that make him a victim of suffering. There's something wrong with him up there. And he's hated by a lot of people outside the church, and he's also hated by a lot of people inside the church. The guy's out of his mind. The other thing they said is, he's not a very good speaker. He's not eloquent by the standards of contemporary Greek rhetoric. And Paul wasn't. Paul is one of the most eloquent people I've ever read, but he's very direct and very forceful. He did not use the niceties of contemporary Greek rhetoric. The third thing they said about him is that he didn't use the insights of, and perspectives of contemporary Greek wisdom. And Paul did not. He had no patience with it at all. So what we have in this letter, especially in chapter 2, verse 12, through the end of, cha end of chapter 6, and then first, and chapters 10 through 12, is Paul's defense of his ministry and life. So that he could 
get a hearing and be able to help solve the, the, uh, the, the problems of the church. And what this passage does is lay down uh, the fundamental basis of Paul's claim to authority. Uh, now, he was called to be an apostle. That's what he always insisted on. But when, talk, when you talk about a spiritual life, this is the fundamental basis of his claim to authority. And I want you to notice, first of all, we saw this last week. He admits he fails. Look at verse 12. When I came into Troas for the gospel of Christ, and a door was opened to me in the Lord, I did not have rest in my spirit, because I did not find Titus, my brother, there. But I said goodbye to them, and I went away into Macedonia. Now, here he's explaining... That, his, that he did care about them, and he wanted to show you, this is how much I cared about you. That when I went to Macedonia, I couldn't hang in there. I was too worried about you, so I left. But what this is, is an admission of failure. You have to recognize, Paul had sent a very severe letter to the, to the church at Corinth, uh, demanding that they deal and discipline, deal with and discipline a man who had confronted him publicly. And it was a very severe letter. And he had thought about it, he had talked about it with his colleagues, he had prayed about it for a long period of time, then he sat down and went through it in the manual and just wrote this letter and told him to do this. Now you have to recognize Paul was called to be an apostle. When you're an apostle, what that means is that you gain guidance from God and he leads you that what you say comes directly from him. That's what the word apostle means. When you speak and when you act, it is as if, is as if the one who sent you does. As an apostle of Jesus Christ, he acted and spoke in Jesus' stead with his authority. He'd been praying about this, he thought about it, he came to the point where he sent this letter, and he goes to Troas, a center of commerce and culture and travel. And the Lord had opened the door for him for ministry, for the gospel. What that means is he was about to plant a church, and he could see that this church would become a center for the gospel radiating all throughout that area. Paul could see this happen. But what happened? He didn't have rest in his spirit, he said. What happened? He lost confidence in the direction of Christ. He lost confidence in what he had said after he had prayed and consulted with colleagues and spent all that time thinking about it. And because he lost confidence, he said goodbye, despite the fact the door was open, and he didn't walk through it and didn't take advantage of the opportunity that Jesus had made for him. You look at chapter 7 and verse 5, you can see this. <clears throat> when, I was coming, when I came into Macedonia, I had no rest. My fle our flesh had no rest, but in every way we were afflicted. Fightings out on the outside, fears within. He was overstressed, and his fear got the best of him, and he blew it. He failed. He failed. And he failed, let's face it, because of a loss of faith. A loss of faith in his calling, a loss of faith in the direction of God, a loss of faith in what he had written. And notice that despite this, he says in verse 14, look at that. But thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumphal procession in Christ and manifests through us the fragrance of the knowledge of him in every place. Because we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Paul says, despite the fact that I messed up, I blew it, I failed God uses me to spread the knowledge of him everywhere. And he uses the word us, all of us he does. And he gives us a picture of that as a Roman triumph. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail about this, but a Roman triumph was where a Roman concrete general would come back and have a triumph through the city of Rome. And he was the center of attention. It was the glorious pinnacle of his career. And what this means, what this passage means, is that Jesus, God has already gotten the victory through Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for our sins, defeated the devil, made it possible for us to be reconciled to God, rose victoriously over death and, and, and hell, and now rules at God's right hand. God has won the victory through Jesus Christ. And now, what Paul is saying is, Jesus is, God is, in a triumphal procession throughout the world. In other words, the victory has been won now, Christian life, Christian ministry, the existence of the church is a triumphal procession in which God is being glorified progressively, just like that Roman general is. That's the picture. Okay? And it, God is being glorified not because he has, you know, small self-esteem and needs to have it built up. He's doing that because the knowledge of God is being spread 
by this glorification. People are coming to know that they're sinners in need of God. They're coming to see Jesus as, in his beauty and glory and love and grace and his death and resurrection and all that he's done for them. And they're coming to the knowledge of him. That's what Paul says is happening here. But I want you to recognize the role he had. What's he saying? We're being led in triumph for procession. What you need to know is part of the triumph was the prisoners that were caught, that had been captured by the Roman conqueror. They were taken in chains to the hill of Capitolon. Some of them were going to be executed. Others of them would eventually go back and rule in the name of Rome. And what Paul is saying, my role in the victory of Christ, by which he spreads the knowledge of, of Christ everywhere through me, is I'm a captured slave. In other words, ministry is not about my prowess, my ability, my glory, my victory, my, 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 my ability. I'm a captive prisoner, and God in his grace makes his, grace, makes his greatness known through me. And you can see that here. Look at chapter 16, the end, verse 16 in the end of it. He says, notice the question is, and who is sufficient for these things? Who can make this kind of thing happen? Well, we don't have to guess what he meant, what he, what he thought the answer to that was, if you look at chapter 3 and verse 5. Not that we are sufficient from ourselves to consider anything as from ourselves. <clears throat> Paul is saying, I'm not what makes this thing go. I failed, even in the triumph that is the ministry of the gospel in the world, through me and through the church, I'm nothing more than a captive prisoner. God is making his knowledge known through me. I am frail, broken, weak, and vacillating. The false teachers, now think about this, the false teachers that, who were critics of Paul at Rome had said, Paul isn't qualified. He isn't sufficient. And Paul said, you're right. And he meant it. He meant it. He said, I don't have what it takes to carry the day. I'm simply a captive of the victory of God. By his grace, he displays the knowledge of Jesus through me and through us. And why does he use it? That's what the answer, the rest of the text is about in 16, the end of 16 through 17. Paul, used, Paul is used because he has total reliance on God and not himself. And so what we learn from this text is we take advantage of the victory of God by being utterly God-centered. Okay? We take advantage of the victory of God by being utterly God-centered. And he starts with a question, who is sufficient for these things? And his answer is obvious. It certainly isn't him. Chapter 3 and verse 5, not that we are sufficient from ourselves to consider anything is from ourselves. So he asks the question, and then notice he says, Verse 17, for we are not like the many, peddling the word of God, but as for purity, but as for God and the presence of God in Christ we speak. This is not how to become sufficient in ourselves. That's not what he's saying here. He is saying how to, he is telling us how to be a vessel of the victory of God. Paul isn't praising himself, he is admitting. And it's a real admission that it's God alone who does this. And he says, not like this, not like those who peddle the word of God, I'm not like that, but I'm like this. Pure, from God, in the presence of God, in Christ. Do you see? So he makes a contrast. What you are not supposed to be like, what you're supposed to be like. How do you take advantage of the victory of God? By being utterly God's son. And how do you do this on the ground? This text, right here. And what I want you to understand, and please understand this, this is not, not, not saying that this is how to become adequate or sufficient. That's not going to happen. This is saying this is how, in your brokenness and need, to be a channel of of the power of God. It'll always be about him. It'll never be about us. The one God uses to shine his glory and display the knowledge of Christ and Jesus in the world is this sort of a person. 
Okay. First, what are we not supposed to do? We don't see is is it as our duty to market or peddle the Bible to win adherence. We don't see it as our duty to market or peddle the message to win adherence. Okay? That's what we don't do. It says, for we are not like the many, I don't know what your translation says, peddling the word of God. Properly what this word means is to sell something for profit. But it was frequently used in a pejorative sense, hawking, peddling. Um, the old phrase is the guy's a snake oil salesman, you know? He's selling something, but the real thing is he's talking so fast that he gets you to buy something you don't really need and it's worthless. Or, or, or the other thing it can mean is this. If you heard the expression, that guy can sell ice cubes to Eskimos. Because it's all about the sales pitch, right? Not about the product. That's what this word means, okay? It frequently means to adulterate something or to use sharp methods to win sales. It's used of philosophers adapting the teaching to entice, to entice adherents so their school would grow. The idea is to do what it takes to win favor and sell the product. So the focus is on what I bring, the salesmanship, the behavior, the charm, the relationship I build, so that people would embrace the message. That's what Paul said. We don't do that. He doesn't use clever speech or rhetoric. He doesn't make a selective emphasis on the message, not mentioning the hard part. You see the fundamental idea involved? Without my skill, without my rhetorical ability, without the adaptation and shine I put on this thing, nobody would buy it. It needs me to make it work. I need to adapt it. I need to use my charm and ability and skill and rhetoric and bring in the wisdom of the world in order that people can embrace the message. Uh, we do that all the time. Why do you think we use athletes to sell things they don't know anything about? People listen to athletes. Well, you got to be like that, don't you? By the way, in history, this has been the bane of the Church of Christ. You've heard of Protestant liberalism, haven't you? You know where it got started? There's a guy named Schleiermacher who said that there are people who are in the world who are educated, the cultured people, are never going to believe the message as it is. There are too many accretions, there are too many things in here that, that modern people can't believe. And so what we need to do is to save the core of the message and take out the extra stuff that really doesn't matter, that people can't believe and adapt it, so we can win the cultured despisers of the gospel. In other words, we need to adapt the message, the way of doing church, in order to win these people who are up here. You know what happened? None of those cultured despisers came to church, and the church, the liberal church, declined and is close to death. By the way, that's what was happening in, in 1 John and the book of Revelation. They were adapting the message so that they could win the people in their culture to the, to the, the culture of the day. That's what was happening in Corinth. They were using Greek wisdom in order to make it seem like it was closer to what those people already thought because they thought they would get a hearing. And modern evangelicals have done a similar thing. Now, they haven't failed to believe the whole gospel, but they've used the science of marketing. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with good printing, professional communication, graphics, and the use of social media or anything else like that. I'm not against any of those things. But the fundamental assumption of marketing is this, is that you begin with the customer. You understand their felt needs, their values, their comfort level, their, their perspectives, their desires, and their aspirations, and you adapt your product the church, and the message to their perspectives, their needs, their, their wants, their desires. And in doing that, you will get them to come and participate and become part of the movement. That's what political parties do. Make a bigger tent to get more people into the party. Well, that's the method of marketing. So what defines the ministry and the message in that case? Well, we still believe the whole Bible, 
But what we talk about is what the lost culture wants to hear. The, the people cut off from God who are disobedient. And what the whole idea behind this is that this 2,000 year old book and its me message is outdated and we must bring it up to date and shape its presentation so that and, and, and the way we act and what we do in such a way will for me, says the Lord. Has not my hand made all these things and so they've come into being, says the Lord? What does he say? I don't need anything from you. Plain and simple. I made everything. He gives us the privilege of serving him. And then he says, this is the one I esteem. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. That is to say, I, I take this is from the mouth of God. Do you think he needs our help? The, our reading today was, Cursed is the man who trusts in the arm of flesh. The people who belong to God who trust in human ability as their focus and human wisdom and human effort as their focus, that's what they're trusting in, will experience the active opposition of God. The one who is blessed is the one who trusts in God. Is, do you think the message is so lame and incomplete that it needs crutches? The crutches of contemporary wisdom? Do you think God does not know the hearts of all humankind in all generations so that we have to update his message so it could get in the hearing? We also do the same thing with our obedience. What, you think, what makes you think that you need to um, identify with causes and fads and political parties and candidates to win and adherence of other people? and compromise your obedience to Jesus Christ. Does God's word and God's commands need to be adapted for application for life in the 21st century? Did not God see the end from the beginning? Charles Spurgeon said something I've never forgotten. He was once asked to defend the Bible in a lecture. And he looked at the guy like he'd lost his mind. He said, defend the Bible? I'd assume defend the lion. All I need to do is let it out of its cage. I believe in biblical apologetics. That is defending the faith. But it's the Bible that gives you what you have to say. It's this, you explain why this is true. Not say, well, this is what contemporary wisdom says, and so we can find it here. No, that's not it. So Paul says, we're not like that. We don't think that we're in the place that we have to somehow apologize for or manipulate or change or act a certain way or adapt the message to the world. That's not what we do. We take it as from God. It begins there. And the second thing he says is we have to be utterly dependent upon God for our, utterly dependent on God. And he, has, he gives us four overlapping ways of looking at this. Do I have the right time here? It's, my watch says 11.02. Yeah, because yeah, it stopped already. Okay, good. Look at it. It says in verse 17, We are not like the many, adulterating the word of God, or peddling it, or hawking it, but, now he goes on to the qualities he does have, but as from purity, but as from God, in the presence of God, in Christ we speak. Four overlapping ways in which we express our dependence upon God. The first one this probably should be translated pure. Some of your translations have sincere. Literally what it means is to, it's literally is a word, is the combination of two words, to judge and son. And it means to judge by the light of the sun. The idea is you could take it outside in the full light and you would find no flaw. This does not mean perfectly faithful. It means never lapse, never lapse, never have a lapse in confidence. Paul already said that wasn't true. It doesn't mean sinless. What he did, what, it means that we're utterly committed and devoted to God. We're pure in our devotion to Him and His Word. Sincere is okay as long as by that you don't mean 
I feel sincere by heart. My heart is really there, and never mind what I do. We use sincerity that way. That's not what that means. What this means is, as far as I am able, I am completely devoted to this book and to God's way. And then notice the second thing he says. We're not like the many who adulterate the word of God, but ask from purity, but ask from God. This means that we always recognize that we're sent by God in our conduct and our speech. What a difference would it make? What difference would it make if you thought about it everywhere you went and everything you did that you've been sent by God? That you're there as his representative. That what's happening now is under his control and you're there to speak for him. I was amazed when I saw this uh, on a book by John Stott. He was talking about the Lordship of Christ. And he talked about a politician during the Victorian era in Parliament. And somebody asked him why he voted the way he did. And his answer was, unapologetically, turned to him and said, I voted in such a way that if my master showed up right now, I, my vote would be able to bear his scrutiny. In other words, he was a politician called by God to do his bidding where he was. This will change your life. I once got a chance to take a different flight, leave earlier, get money for another flight, and get home quicker to Germany. That was the choice. I said, piece of cake, I'm going. So I got on the airplane, and it was delayed. <laughs> when I came to get the, the connection, they didn't have my name. I said, I need another ticket. They said, you can't get one. What are you talking about? So I went downstairs and waited for five hours till about midnight when this guy said, I can't help you today. I'll put you on a flight tomorrow. Tomorrow? You said I was going to get there earlier. I'm supposed to be there tomorrow. I have to work. Too bad. I said, well, I was starving. I hadn't eaten. Looked at my wallet. No cash. It was after midnight. Do, can I get some food, some money for food? <clears throat> We can put you up at the Hilton, but we can't give you any money. You can get food here, but all the restaurants are shut down. You'll have to wait until tomorrow at 10. My flight left about 1. So I go, I go back to the Hilton and, you know, went to sleep for a few hours. I had got up the next morning, got there, and they gave me this little voucher. So I was in this one airport, but it was a Delta voucher, and I was going on an American Airlines. So I had to go to the other airline. You know, I don't know where I was, but to some other airport, B or C or something like that, I had to find my way over there, got lost a few times. Finally figured out how to go there, and when I got there, I couldn't believe what things cost. So I pulled my change out and got myself a sandwich. And I, I went back the other way, and then for some reason I had to go back over here again and then come back again. And I'm sitting in the airport, there's nothing I can do, and I run into this guy who's got a foreign accent and says, can you help me? I need to find X. Now, you know, I knew how because I'd been going back and forth. And I was going to tell him, but I realized he wouldn't be able to follow me. And what popped in my mind is, you were sent by God. And I thought, this guy must have prayed, and God sent me here to help him. So I took him almost by the hand all the way over there. That's my point. It's a life changer when you think about these things. If you recognize that in everything you're sent by God, it'll change your life. And then he says, in the presence of God, with the full knowledge that all we do is in his sight. I trusted my daughter to go anywhere she wanted to and come home when she wanted to when she was 17 years old. I did. Because I knew her, and I knew that she had gotten this into her head. That what she did, she did on the side of God. And I did not worry about her in the least. My sons, <laughs> it's a changer. And to give you a summary of all these, I'm going to give a, a tribute to my, my dear friend. Uh, she's with the Lord now. Her name is Ginny Kilmer. 
um, her, her kids said about her, her adult children said, oh, this is all you have to know about Virginia. Now, she never introduced herself as Virginia, but that's what they called her when they gave her this condescending, this condescending description. My mother, Virginia, uh, these two things you have to know about her. She has no unexpressed opinions. And for her, every, every, there, she sees the dark lining in every silver cloud. You know you're supposed to see the silver lining in every dark cloud. Well, she sees the dark lining in every silver cloud. If you think I'm a pessimist, you never met anybody like, like Ginny. Um, they also said you, she was given to exaggeration. And her, and her son-in-law said, what you have to do when Ginny says anything is, is cut it in half and knock some off that, and that's, that'll get you close to what she means. <laughs> she had gone through a horrible divorce. Her, her husband had committed adultery with a younger woman and left her for him and abandoned her and the kids. And she raised them by herself, and he didn't have much relationship with, that, with them from that time onward. She moved up to New England just to get away from all her surroundings because all it did was remind her of her marriage. She was upset, and but then all her kids ended up moving up there, so she had all her children around her, and um, as a Christian, she was struggling. She says, I know I have to forgive him. I know I'm called by God. I can cite the verses, but it's the, the pain and the wound was still raw. And I used to listen to her as she talked about it. And I remember the time she told me, my husband, my ex-husband, wants to move up here. He's just retired. He wants to move up here so he can be close to the kids. And he asked me if I knew any realtors. He has not talked to me in, I don't know, 20 years. He hasn't really had any relationship with the kid except for the kids with except an occasional phone call. And now he's moving up here. And she was in a rage that now she's going to come back into his life and have the gall to ask for help with a realtor. And we had this long conversation, and let me tell you, it was hard going on. But then she said, I know that God is sovereign. I know I'm called to, be wit to witness. I'm probably the only Christian he knows. And that woman he's bringing up there, she never mentioned her name, that woman with, you know, you can imagine what she thought of that woman. That woman doesn't know any Christians except me. And so I know God has done this so that he can hear the gospel. This is her perspective. I'm here for him. I have to forgive him. I don't get off the hook. I've got to do it. And so she decided to invite them to a barbecue, which she sponsored at her house, at her place, so that they could have a comfortable place to reestablish the relationship with the children. And then she felt so sorry for this woman who would be horrified to be in that situation. Here she is, in tow, knowing that she's the hole breaker. What am I doing here? That Ginny went out of her way to befriend this woman and make her feel comfortable. That's what this is talking about. Okay, I'm called. I do this in the presence of God. I don't have off. I, I don't have a. I can't adapt the message and the commands because I've gone through something particularly difficult so that I don't have to forgive. I can't do that. I have to do what it says. And I know that in this situation, who I am. I am a representative of Jesus. I've been sent by God. And I'm doing it in his presence. When she talked about it with me, it was raw and painful. But when she did it, she did it the best she could. And by the way, that woman was the best evangelist of our church. Um, she used the Westminster Catechism, but that's another story to, to win people to Christ. And I baptized some of those people. This is what I'm talking about. Okay, Her life was tough. She had gone through difficulty. She was weak and frail and had a hard time doing what God said that she should do. But in utter sincerity, knowing that she was sent by God, knowing that she did everything in the presence of God, she refused to compromise anything God said. And she passed it on just the way it was, by her behavior and by what she passed, what she taught. That's what we're talking about. And the last thing he says here is in Christ, which means by virtue of my relationship to Jesus. Because I'm united with him, I am strengthened by this. I depend on him every moment. I asked another friend of mine who was from Winchester, Chris Gibbs, I said, what keeps you going in all this ministry you're doing? 
And she looked at me and went, Jesus. Jesus is Lord. That's what she said. That was enough. She was related to him. She came to him. She prayed to him. She leaned on him. That's why every Sunday, when Dale was here, you would find him on his face in church, praying, if you got here early enough. And I don't do that, because I don't want to be caught out and have people see me do that. But every Sunday morning, I'm on my knees. That's the first thing I do. Because I recognize it isn't about me, it's about him. And I, there is no way to get this done any other way. We have to be entirely God-centered. It's not about us. God has been victorious. Jesus died on the cross, defeated sin. He rose to the dead and defeated death. Now he rules as Lord. And there is a triumphant procession throughout history. And he spreads the knowledge of him through us in every place. And the only people that are sufficient for this is not because of something they did. It's those people who recognize their insufficiency and are completely God-centered. They don't try to compromise the Word of God. They don't try to change it. They don't think they have to adapt it. It's nothing about their skill. They take it as it is, and they are sincerely devoted to it. They recognize they're sent by Him, that they do everything in His presence, and that they're attached to Him. That's the way to cash in on the victory of God. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Father, thank You for uh, the victory of Jesus Christ. Thank You that we have been conquered by Him by grace, that by your grace we are captives of him, and that you spread through us the knowledge of Jesus in every place. That's the truth about us in our ministry and our lives. We thank you for this incredible privilege, and we also thank you, Father, that as, just as the image says, one day we will rule with you. We thank you for all of that. And we pray, our Father, that we would not fall into the temptation of the triumphal attitude of the evangelical church thinking that somehow the grace of God makes us sufficient. It doesn't. What it does is it uses our insufficiency to bring glory to God. I pray that we would see that, and we would link ourselves with you, and we would humble ourselves under your, under your message and depend utterly on you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Our closing hymn. Leaning on the everlasting arms.
receive the benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in glory, majesty, power, and authority, before all ages, now, and forevermore. Amen.